Welcome, everybody. We are, we are just going to have a little um, short welcome, and then we're going to start our session on environmental defenders um, in times of pandemic. Um, we're going we're gonna to start with Angela Karuki. Thanks very much, Dina, and I hope everybody can, can hear me okay. So, my name is Angela. I am a program officer in UNEP's Law Division. And I work on human rights in the environment, as well as on mineral resource governance. I also coordinate the implementation of UNEP's policy on environmental human rights defenders. Dina, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Dina Lupin. I am the Deputy Director in the Global Network for Human Rights in the Environment. Um, we are a network of activists and um, scholars and thinkers and practitioners all working on and uh, collaborating on issues relating to human rights and the environment. Um, and if you don't know who we are, I'd encourage you to go and check us out. We, um, you can find us at gnhre.org. Um, and we are, are very excited and pleased to welcome you to our inaugural Summer Winter School, co-organized and co-hosted by the United Nations Environment Program and the Global Network. Um, when we first came up with the idea of creating an online summer winter school, we uh, had a vision for a few classes on critical issues and perspectives in human rights and the environment. And I don't think any of us imagined for a moment that we would be offering over 14 classes taught by more than 35 leading scholars, activists, policymakers, UN experts and program leaders and practitioners from across the globe over five days. We also didn't anticipate the many hundreds of participants who've registered to participate in our classes. Um, we are thrilled to have you all here and we um, extend our warmest welcome and thanks to you all. Thanks so much, Dina. Um, and from UNEP's side, we couldn't be more delighted or more grateful for the time, the energy, the creativity, and the thought that our extensive faculty has put into creating what is sure to be a fascinating week of uh, discussion, of presentations, and of learning. Um, the impacts of this summer winter school are going to extend beyond this week. We're recording the sessions, and they'll hopefully form the basis of a series of teaching modules that we hope to develop over the next coming months. As this is our very first summer winter school, we've also learned a huge amount in organizing this event, and we hope to build on this incredible start in, in future years. We're already looking at ways uh, that the future summer winter schools can include accreditation, as well as the participation of those with so much uh, to teach, but limited access to internet platforms such as this one. So um, for our first panel today, I think uh, we couldn't be starting with a better panel than one on environmental and human rights defenders in times of pandemic. So without further delay, I want to hand over to my great colleague Georgina Lloyd, who will be moderating this, se this session. Um, Georgina is the regional coordinator for Asia and the Pacific Regional Office of UNEP on environmental law and governance. Um, so Georgie, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Angela, and thank you to Dina as well. Um, we are very happy to be the first session in the Summer Winter School. Uh, and indeed, as Angela just said, this particular session is really going to explore the role of environmental defenders and the particular challenges that they have faced during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have a stellar lineup of, of speakers today, um, and I'm going to quickly introduce each of them. But before I do a couple of housekeeping reminders, uh, please do keep yourself muted unless you're talking. Um, we will be recording the session as has been said, um, and we will uh, go under uh, general rules of, um, if you would like to introduce yourself, by all means you, you can, but you do not need to identify your affiliation when asking a question. Um, so I will turn over to introducing my speakers. Um, first of all, we have Dr. Dylan McGarry. And Dylan is an environmental educational sociologist and artist from Durban, South Africa. He is a senior researcher at the Environmental Learning Research Center at the university currently known as Rhodes, as well as a co-director of the Global One Ocean Hub uh, Research Network. Dylan is the co-founder of Empathita and a passionate artist and storyteller. 
He explores practice-based research into connective aesthetics, transgressive social learning, decolonization, queer eco-pedagogy, immersive empathy, and responding to ecological apartheid in South Africa. His artwork and social praxis, which is closely related to his research, is particularly focused on empathy, and he primar primarily works with imagination, listening, and intuition as act actual sculptural materials in social settings to offer new ways to encourage personal, relational, and collective agency. Joining Dylan uh, from the same location in the field at the moment is Taryn uh, Pereira Kaplan, who is an activist, researcher, and facilitator with a background in urban water justice and social learning to support civil society networks. Taryn is currently a co-investigator on the One Ocean Hub, focusing on building solidarity between academic research and com community-based activists working across disciplines, sectors, and knowledge systems towards coastal justice. As a researcher and co-facilitator of the Lelela Uwando project, Taryn experienced the incredibly powerful role that empathy can play in bridging many of the intractable dividing lines in our society. Race, class, gender, literacy, language, and in doing so, set the stage for the building of equitable relationships between different groups of people based on critical, reflexive solidarity. We also have joining us Dr. Mary Menton, who is a research fellow with the University of Sussex's Sustainability Research Program. She works with Not One More, to support frontline environmental defenders in Brazil. Her new co-edited book, Environmental Defenders, Deadly Struggles for Life and Territory has, or is about to be released. It's already, the previews of it has, have been released uh, and you will be able to get it this month from the 25th of June. We also have Fran Lambrick, who is the co-founder of Not One More which of course uh, you may be familiar with them. They are a campaign group with frontline environmental defense. Fran is a researcher and film work, filmmaker. Uh, she has made films such as I Am Chut Pussy and On The Line. She is interested in understanding the relationships between people and the natural world and the root causes of violence against those who protect land and forests. We also have uh, Dr. Pichamon Yu Fentong, who is an Australian Research Council Fellow and Senior Lecturer at the University of New South Wales. She leads the Responsible Business Lab and the Environmental Justice and Human Rights Project. In addition to her multi-year project on how to better regulate the social and environmental impacts of Chinese investment overseas, Pichamon is currently working with civil society and other institutional partners a set of projects that seek to support the resilience of women leaders, environmental defenders, and the rule of law in Asia Pacific. Uh, then we also have Professor Elisa Mogera from the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow, who specializes in international biodiversity law and its linkages with human rights, notably the rights of indigenous peoples and small scale fishing communities. Uh, she looks at everyone's right to health and science and business responsibility to protect human rights. She is the director of the One Ocean Hub, a global interdisciplinary research collaboration of research institutions in the UK, Africa, South Pacific and the Caribbean, as well as UN agencies and other international partners. The o One Ocean Hub is pioneering research on human rights and the marine environment with a view to better connecting marine and social sciences and the arts to support fair and inclusive decision making for a healthy ocean whereby people and planets flourish. So with that amazing lineup of speakers, I am now delighted to turn over to Pitchamon, who will introduce a really fun interactive tool that we're going to be using throughout our session today. Pitchamon, over to you. Thank you, Georgie, um, and great to see everyone here. We're very much aware that there is a wealth of expertise and experience in this virtual room. So what we thought we would do is to get people onto Jamboard. I've just added, um, put through the link to uh, Jamboard again into the chat. Um, if you could all go on there and start filling out, um, you can start now or you can start during uh, the presentations, uh, your thoughts, 
um, in relation to the four questions posed, that would be wonderful so that we um, as a group can also come back to this and reflect on on what your insights are as to what is your relationship with the environment, who are environmental defenders, what is the role of environmental defenders, and what do you observe in your country for environmental defenders, particularly in light of the COVID pandemic um, as being the challenges um, and opportunities for environmental defenders, that is. So if you can start populating uh, the slides, that would be wonderful. Uh, there are altogether seven slide decks, so if one gets filled out, don't worry, just hit on the arrow and go on to the next one. Um, so please feel, to, feel free to do that um, as we uh, progress through this session. And I think that's pretty much it for Jamboard. So on that note, um, if you do have any questions about this activity, please feel free to put through your questions into the chat box. Um, otherwise, I think we will get started. Um, so in that regard, um, shall we, are all of the panelists ready to go? I'll get a show of faces and hands. Excellent, wonderful. Um, so let me just start off with a fairly basic fundamental question. Who are environmental human rights defenders? And perhaps Georgie, you can kick us off with your insights um, and definition. Thank you so much, Pichiman. Um, and I guess we can refer to a few definitions that have been used by various UN entities. Um, of course, the UN Human Rights or OHCHR uh, refers to human rights defenders as people who individually or with others act to promote and protect human rights in a peaceful manner. According to OHCHR, human rights defenders are identified above all by what they do, and it is through a description of their actions that they can be uh, identified. So they say that HRDs um, work in collecting and disseminating information on violations, supporting victims of human rights violations, taking action to secure accountability and to end impunity, supporting governance and policy, and creating awareness of human rights amongst other things. More specifically, we have defined, we, the UN have defined EHRDs or environmental human rights defenders as individuals and groups who in their personal or professional capacity and in a peaceful manner, strive to protect and promote human rights relating to the environment, including water, air, land, flora, and fauna. UNEP considers uh, an environmental defender to be anyone, including groups of people, women human rights defenders and others who are defending environmental rights. And those environmental rights include constitutional rights to a clean and healthy environment, um, and when the exercise of those rights is being threatened. Of course, environmental rights can include both substantive rights, so rights to a clean and healthy environment, rights to clean air, uh, rights to safe and sustainably produce food, for example, and procedural rights, which is things like um, uh, free prior informed consent, rights to participation, uh, rights to access information, for example. Uh, and of course, EHRDs can be a broad range of individuals and groups. They can be communities, they can be lawyers, they can be the staff of national human rights commissions, uh, indigenous peoples, children and youth. And often the work of uh, indigenous peoples uh, is linked to environmental justice. And evidence has shown that, of course, environmental harm disproportionately impacts individuals, groups and peoples already living in vulnerable situations. And these include women and children, the poor, ethnic, sexual and gender minority, migrants, indigenous peoples and persons with disability. And often environmental human rights defenders represent these groups. There's close connections, I would also say, with environmental justice, which is worth um, linking because often environmental justice is the equal protection and involvement of all people with respect to development, implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, policies and the equitable distribution of environmental benefits. And so often 
environmental human rights defenders are closely interlinked with uh, issues of environmental justice. I'll, I'll leave it there. Back to you, Pitsuman. Thank you very much, Georgie, for that extremely comprehensive definition of EHRDs. Now, on to you, Mary. I understand that you work a lot in Latin America. Uh, can you tell us what you think or who you think are environmental human rights defenders and what defines them? Thanks. Thanks, Pichuman, and thanks, Georgie. Um, that is a bit of a hard act to follow. I think Georgie's done a really good job of, of talking about so many of the different uh, aspects of who who are environmental defenders. So I think I will maybe just share some examples because I think sometimes we, one of the things that with our research we've been looking at is that we tend to focus on individuals as environmental defenders and there's a lot of focus on killings of environmental defenders. Um, but actually a lot of people are very much see themselves as part of a collective process and a, and a movement and they are not seeing themselves as 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 a figurehead and i think that's an important point um but they are by and large the people who stand up against environmental destruction they stand up against the um, expansion of the frontiers of deforestation. They stand up against a mining company that's polluting their waters. Um, and they do that despite the threats they face. Many of them face death threats. Many of them face criminalization. Many of them face um, attacks on their legitimacy, smear campaigns. You know, these they are people who who fight against those uh, fight against um, environmental destruction despite all of the threats that they face, and I think it's important to to recognize the courage that they that they have and the role that they have in in bringing issues to the forefront. And they use so many different creative ways. And I think it's interesting that the you know people we have here today people who are talking about art and talking about empathy and talking about ways to to um, use different different methods uh, to be an environmental defender. So it's not just about being at a protest or signing a petition, but actually people who are artists are also can be environmental defenders. And I think it's important to think about, bring that to the table as well. And I'll, I'll stop for now. Thank you very much, Mary. And I hope that we'll have a bit of time to go into those different methods um, and different approaches to being an environmental defender as well. Now, on to you, Fran. Um, and I personally regard you as an environmental human rights defender. You've worked for such a long time in Cambodia. You've done a variety of things to raise awareness about important uh, social and environmental problems in the country. Can you tell us what makes an environmental human rights defender? Here we go. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Pichamon. Um, yeah, thanks for that very generous introduction. Um, we were actually having a conversation recently about, like, within Not One More, about whether we consider ourselves environmental human rights defenders. And, and I was particularly sort of saying in that conversation that I see myself as a supporter of frontline environmental human rights defenders. But as you say, I think. Um, having been involved in this for a long time, you know, it does, you know, it's, it's interesting when we reflect on ourselves and our own role, we're often more reluctant to sort of claim that identity of being an activist or being a human rights defender. Um, and I think, you know, all of us here, probably there are ways in which we act to protect the environment and ways in which we act that um, advances human rights. Um, and sort of acknowledging that and claiming it as part of our identity can be a very empowering thing. And one thing perhaps to add to what Mary was saying, um, I would also raise the example of some environmental human rights defenders whom we work with who have even received death threats. But part of the challenge that they face is that they um, will focus on the support role that they have for others. So I'm thinking particularly of a lawyer who we work with in Brazil. Um, 
uh, who has herself received death threats, but she is constantly um, focused on supporting those who she represents legally. Um, and um, we kind of put a lot of energy into sort of saying, no, you also are a human rights defender and are someone who um, really deserves that recognition and that support. Um, and so what we do at Law and More is actually a lot of our work is involved in making that support more accessible um, and in really uh, trying to help those who are at risk to pay attention to their own safety, to prioritize their well-being. Um, and I would just add, I think everyone's introduced, um, you know, who are environmental human rights defenders very well, but I would just also perhaps add uh, that there are also really intersectional challenges. So a lot of people who are at risk because of their work to protect the environment and to protect, protect human rights are, may also be facing discrimination based on gender or based on their sexuality or their identity as indigenous people. Um, and so um, it's often a complex intersection of threats and challenges that are faced. Um, and also there are many opportunities for you know, advancing human rights in multiple areas. So a lot of environmental human rights defenders are also engaged in defending other human rights. Uh, I'll leave it there. Great, thank you, Fran. And that's a really important point about intersectionality, of course, which is a point that I also would like to ask um, Elisa uh, about a bit more. Given that you your work with One Ocean Hub, um, I understand that you do a lot of work um, with ocean environmental human rights defenders. Um, and sometimes we understand that there's a lot of focus on land-based environmental human rights defenders, but are you able to tell us a bit more about perhaps any of the unique traits or common traits of those working on oceans and, and to protect um, marine life and so forth? Thank you very much, Pichamon. And just to say, all I've learned about human rights defenders really is um, secondhand from the work that Dylan and Taria and their colleagues in South Africa are carrying out. And in that sense, I think my, my contribution today is really to um, share with you and others on the call what I have learned as a kind of a maybe desk-based environmental and human rights lawyer in understanding the, the needs and the opportunities for academics and others to contribute and support uh, defenders and researchers who are more, I think, on the first line. Um, one, one thing I have picked up both in um, uh, international forum involved in and also in, in scholarship is that most of the attention has focused on land defenders and ocean defenders are a bit um, left behind, partly because in, in many regions, not all regions, but in many regions, the ocean itself and marine protection is lagging behind compared to terrestrial protection. But also in terms of the science, we're still not fully understanding what, what we need to do to protect the ocean and how that interfaces with our uh, protection of terrestrial biodiversity, for instance. And in fact, it's been through the lived experience of ocean defenders, which we have been working with under the One Ocean Hub, that we, we understand so much better and more vividly those interconnections between the needs to protect terrestrial biodiversity and the environment and the marine environment. And also, in some cases, the spiritual connections that certain uh, indigenous peoples and other communities may have, for instance, to very distant regions of the oceans, like the deep seabed, and how they may understand ecological needs, as well as impacts on human rights that for many other sectors of population are um, a distant fantasy at best. So I think the, the role of human rights defenders, and particularly ocean defenders, is that of um, conveying, I guess, to the rest of us, how interconnected we are in so many different ways to a healthy ocean and in so many ways how multiple human rights are some uh, everyone's human rights but in some cases with major impacts on particular individuals and groups human rights um, are increasingly being undermined by our uh, unsustainable choices on the ocean um, and with that they also convey a very clear sense again based on their lived experience on the needs that we need to respond to in terms of protection of the marine environment, in terms of protection uh, and you know, raising awareness about the protection of human rights that depend on a healthy ocean and the needs that uh, defenders themselves have and how um, academics and uh, local uh, legal NGOs and others 
what we need to do to be supportive and the UN system as well, what we need to, to do to be supportive and learn from uh, human rights, environmental human rights defenders. Thank you, Alyssa. That's that's again very comprehensive, very insightful, um, and segues very nicely into the question that I have for Dylan. Hello, Dylan. Um, so, Hi. Based, based on your obviously on your body of work and advocacy and activism, but also based on what Alyssa was saying just now, clearly you've worked a lot with on the ground with oceans defenders. Can you tell us a bit more? What motivates an ocean defender? Yes, I'm actually going to hand over to Taryn to start and then I'll follow from her. But yeah, T, go ahead. Thanks so much. Um, and thank you very much for all of the, um, yeah, the incredible layers and building of this rounded definition and picture of who environmental human rights defenders are. Um, so we wanted to highlight a particular aspect coming from our work on coastal justice in which, um, community based activists, including um, fisher folk and uh, people who are deriving a livelihood um, and life world intertwined with ocean ecosystems um, are responding to pressures, um, which pressures such as coastal mining, um, oil and gas explorations in the seabed, pollution, um, commercial fishing practices and so on are impacting on uh, coastal communities in, and in the same way and in and adding to that pressure, the efforts to protect ocean biodiversity through protected areas are another layer of pressure landing on coastal communities so that um, often uh, something like a new mine as, and, and a new marine protected area can be felt in very similar ways for coastal human rights, um, environmental human rights defenders. Um, traditional fisher folk might not identify themselves as environmental or human rights activists. They're engaged in the struggle for the right to their life and livelihoods, but in working for this, they are right on the front lines of experiencing and responding to environmental and social injustices on the coastline. They have specialized intergenerational knowledge about ocean biodiversity, to changes in the environment, to pollution, the impacts of mining, as well as to the, the ways in which the criminalization of their livelihoods through the regulation of protected areas, um, they are right, they are experiencing that. And therefore we who are working for environmental justice should work in support of these communities and organizations and should see um, small scale fishers and their allies and their organizations as really being leaders um, and at the forefront of responding to environmental injustice along our coasts and oceans. Um, sometimes there's a poor understanding coming from people who are working for ocean health um, who see anyone who derives a livelihood from the ocean as somehow posing a threat to ocean health. And we're working to transform that relationship and that understanding um, so that there's greater solidarity between environmental movements and fisher rights movements. Yes, and then just to add um, on something that Elisa was saying um, about the spiritual dimension, in a lot of our work, uh, uh, and also to add to the the work of our work in empathy theater and working with artists, is that there's a there's a big gap also um, from a Western perspective of understanding environmental justice, that doesn't consider the many ways in which spiritual dimensions and ancestors are entangled with activities and actions of the everyday, and so. Um, we find the role of art and music and theater a really powerful tool in supporting in service work for ocean defenders, um, precisely because the ocean, especially here in South Africa, is deeply connected to uh, cultural intangible heritages. So often they might not identify as environmental defenders, but they're actually defending sacred land or sacred space or the water itself as sacred. Um, and so that work requires another layer of nuance in our response with policy, our response with 
at, at governance and decision making processes. And we've also found it very powerful working in these communities with young artists um, who identify as activists. And we're actually working with a group of young artists who are also traditional healers who are kind of just just been initiated as um, kind of spiritual practitioners in their communities who are very passionate about protecting these places, not they don't separate this human nature divide or for them it's work that their ancestors have asked them to do and and this is why they're doing it. Um, so there is there needs to be a reframing also of how we are are defining environment and defining the things that that people are protecting. It's it's often very different to the way maybe the UN or other groups actually define these things. Um, and so we're learning how better to to reflect that and and be true to those realities and and to support that that work that they've been kind of told to do from by their ancestors. Great. Thank you very much, Dylan. And sorry, can I please ask for your colleague's name again? Taryn Pereira Kaplan. I'll put it in the I try to change our profile name so it's both of us, but it didn't seem to work. <laughs> that's all right. That's the beauty of technology. It, it doesn't work when you want it to. <laughs> but no, thank you to all of our presenters for for really explaining to us the, the richness that makes up an environmental human rights defender, but also the different layers of identity um, and the challenges even in identifying an environmental human rights defender perhaps doesn't only just emanate from others, but also emanates from the individual themselves, um, which is a notion that I find very intriguing, but also really important to acknowledge, um, again, given the intersectional issues that have been mentioned, but also the challenges in getting states to acknowledge um, environmental human rights defenders in the first place. So thank you again to to all um, all of the speakers. Now, the next question, set of questions I was going to ask really concerns what kind of role does an environmental human rights defender play when it comes to sustainable development and addressing threats to vulnerable environments and communities? I think in your in your own way, you've all kind of responded to this question. So let allow me to to perhaps um, tailor it a little bit more to what you've already said. So Dylan and uh, Taryn, if I could ask you to turn your video back on. <laughs> Please let me start with you, um, given that you were talking just now about the spiritual aspect and the spiritual contribution that coastal or oceans defenders make. Can you elaborate a little bit more? And I guess my question is, if we didn't have these coastal environmental defenders doing the work that they're doing, could anyone else be doing this work? Mm. I mean, as maybe the, just to elaborate on what I mean by that to start was that so some of so we did a play called La Lelo Luanche, which was you know, of oral histories of coastal peoples up and down our coastline, um, and in 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 Guni language speaking peoples across South Africa, there is a deep connection between the ocean, the river systems, and the ocean is where the soul travels after you die. So um, it moves when you bury a um, a family member. The rain pushes the soul out of the body, and this the soul travels into the sea and into the deep sea. And so, um, the 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 idea of oil and gas exploration in the deep sea, especially in the seabed, um, is very concerning to um, many people along our coastline because it's the equivalent of mining heaven um, in in that cosmovision. And 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 so. Uh, this wasn't kind of clear to us when we first began, but as we started working and surfacing stories, what's driving the kind of response around this um, is not always around resources or access to tangible things like land or, um, but more an intangible, but very important aspect of spirituality and identity. So um, this has led us to kind of think about quite different ways of responding to, to this work. Um, and the role that we need to play, I think, for us is trying to to find ways in which we can make those intangible um, intangible heritages uh, more accessible in some of the decision making spaces, and to be re um, affirmed and seen as such. Um, so we're using a variety of different instruments to do that, from you know public storytelling, counter hegemonic mapping. You know, mapping is a very powerful tool that's used 
um, to kind of silence a lot of voices. So we work a lot with trying to create new maps and new approaches to mapping so that people can claim space around that. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add. Well, just to say that um, the, the, the distinctive nature of, for example, um, traditional customary fishing people and their communities is a is a that is a distinctive and irreplaceable um, system of knowledge relationship connection um, which occurs on these on the very on, on these many different layers as Dylan has said on the lay on the level of the spiritual on the level of livelihoods on the level of intergenerational knowledge um, and on the level of um redress and transformation of um you know hundreds of years of injustice due to colonialism apartheid neoliberal policies that continue to exclude and so for, for so many reasons um these should be um um we should be allies to these groups as being um the the, the leaders and the most um yeah, the, 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 the people and the communities with the most legitimacy to lead the struggle for environmental justice in these contexts. Excellent. Thank you very much to you both. I think um, some really, again, very important concepts there, um, which brings me to my question to you, Elisa, um, given the research that you've done, but also the work that uh, One Oceans Hub has done as well. I wonder whether you could tell us a bit more about what kind of methods or approaches have coastal or oceans defenders used in order to contribute to sustainable development and um, and protecting the ocean. You've already kind of touched on some of these already, but I wonder if you might have some cases or some comparative perspectives to to offer us. Yeah, well, I'm afraid I might not have com comparative reflections yet, and this was one of the reasons why we were so keen to participate in the school today and really compare maybe research and experiences across other regions. What, what we're trying to do with the One Ocean Hub is really trying to not only understand the, the, the role and the struggles and the needs of defenders um, at the local level, but try to scale up that knowledge and also our insights on what has worked at the local level to the national level, regional and cross-regional, and to the international level in the UN. And so what, for example, what we found, I think in terms of like the methods, I think the work that Dylan and Tarin and colleagues are doing, the use of the arts, and Dylan also alluded to um, some work that they're doing on, uh, for instance, an animation to really convey how traditional knowledge can actually be overlapping and being very much aligned with our Western understanding, say, of the water cycle and the role of the ocean. So I think they're doing that incredible work. What, what I'm, tr how I'm trying to contribute and how I think many colleagues on this call can contribute is saying, well, the, the key role of human rights defenders is to be heard. They have a really crucial voice. They should be heard at multiple scales. And, and what I've been thinking more and more is how we can convey that role in a positive term and change the narrative as, as Starin was saying from seeing defenders as troublemakers, as development opponents, as even like conservation opponents to, to allies. And I think where one possibility is to engage policymakers into the concepts that they know and relate to and saying, well, you have a hard time ensuring an ecosystem approach. You have a hard time ensuring that you protect all human rights in your decisions. You have a hard time ensuring transformative change for environmental protection, even if we know that this is what's needed. Well, one way to do all these things is engaging with environmental human rights defenders because they live and breathe and understand and bring all that understanding to you. And so really, uh, I think trying to convey, first of all, I think changing the understanding of, of the role and the value of human rights defenders and then engaging with um, policymakers and advisors at all these levels who say, well, if we do have that understanding, how we translate it into different practices for engaging um, in appropriate and respectful and supportive ways with environmental human rights defenders. Um, and so there's many things that we can explore in terms of how maybe the UN system can have an ongoing dialogue with defenders and how we can ensure um, regional representation as well as representation based on 
um, gender and you know other grounds and um, and some of the what, what we're trying to find out, but I don't think we're quite there yet. What we're experimenting with is seeing whether some of the methodologies and the art based work uh, that's being done at the local level can that be scaled up. Uh, and I think Dylan and colleagues, for instance, have been discussing whether that, that work can be used for environmental impact assessments or for public consultation processes. And that's work that has to be co-developed with the authorities and you know, trial and error. And we're looking into whether we can bring that work and we can find ways for it to be really integrated into international decision making. Can we bring some of that work? Um, to uh, UN negotiators discussing a new treaty on ocean biodiversity and how can they be seen not as a on the sideline interesting activity, but something that really influences their thinking and allows them to to really learn um, and maybe change their mind on certain things through that engagement um, with defenders and their knowledge and understanding. So it's, it's very early days, uh, so very preliminary thinking, a lot of work to be done and hopefully in collaboration with other colleagues across the globe where, where we can learn from each other as we move forward. Great, thank you, Alyssa. And to suppose follow on from your point about trying to gain that comparative understanding of the value of environmental human rights defender, defenders, let me turn to you, Fran. Um, again, I know you work a lot in Cambodia, but also in Southeast Asia more broadly. Can you please tell us more about what kind of role environmental human rights defenders play in Cambodia, in the region, um, to help advance sustainable development? Yes, thank you, Pichamon. Um, yeah, I was, I was just thinking as you were speaking, Elisa, about the way in which um, often environmental human rights defenders, when they're challenging injustice, um, they are pitted against very powerful forces. Um, that's often uh, corporations which are sometimes transnational and which are working in collusion with government. Um, and this means that what we're seeing in Cambodia is the emergence of almost no-go zones, but areas of the forest where corporations, logging companies, um, agricultural businesses that have been engaged in land grabbing and deforestation are essentially protected by local um, elements of the military or even the forest administration uh, soldiers and rangers. Um, and this means that there are areas where participation is an extremely dangerous, participation in protecting the environment is an extremely dangerous thing to take on. And we also see that across Southeast Asia, um, there is an important alliance between environmental defenders and the media. Um, so independent journalists and um, and free media, independent media plays an absolutely critical role in raising the awareness of what is happening in terms of environmental destruction, um, in terms of the links and the drivers behind um, environmental crimes and the loss of forests and lands. Um, and often when media is attacked or when media is constrained by the government, um, this also impacts on the work of environmental human rights defenders. Um, and so, and so often in struggling against these very powerful forces, we're seeing that environmental defenders become isolated or uh, because of the risks that they're taking, relatively few people are, are sometimes willing to participate or to join them in their actions. Um, and one of the initiatives that we found has been very important has been organizing a conference series uh, called the Forest Defenders Conference, which we've been running since 2017. And the important part of this uh, we found in bringing together people from across the world who are engaged in protecting the environment was that they participants said to us that they had a sense of their own struggles and their own um, motivation and challenges that they face being reflected in others um, who might be from a totally different country, um, not speak the same language, but they formed really strong emotional bonds with each other um, at this conference because of seeing that reflection um, of their of their work and of their passion. Um, and the sense of coming together um, as a contradiction to the isolation that often environmental defenders face in their own countries is a really important thing. I'll leave it there. Great, thank you, Fran. And it sounds like the contribution of environmental human rights defenders 
is not only with advancing sustainable development or environmental protection at the national level, but equally about generating or producing transformative change within themselves as well and within their broader communities. Um, so over to you, Mary. Uh, I, again, you've worked a lot in Latin America, um, diverse context there. Are your observations similar to what Elisa, Dylan, Fran, and um, uh, sorry, I'm blanking out again. Um, Dylan's colleague, sorry about that, uh, have already observed. Thank you very much. Um, have already observed or different or? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, yes, I think, I think a lot of what I see is, is quite similar. And I guess maybe just to point out a few, a few ideas that bubble up from what people have said, you know, that. First of all, I see a lot of it. A lot of the role of, of communities and environmental defenders as creating different visions for what the world could and should look like, you know, that it's not necessarily about, yeah, that it's not just about resistance against evil forces, but it's also about being a power for, for, for good and for creating something new and, and, and different or actually going back to the way things used to be and in and, and a, and a, and a more respectful way of, of living and that a lot of the a lot of the defenders that we work with in Latin America they see themselves as defending life in, in the broadest sense that it is not just about the environment and they don't even often see themselves as environmental defenders. They wouldn't use that term because it's not just about the environment. It's about their ancestors. It's about defending the land, defending life in a, in a much broader sense. And so I see it is really important this um, trying to frame things in a more positive way that, that that is about bringing new visions to the table and new ideas and alternatives to development, as I say a lot in Latin America, that it's not about alternative development or sustainable development. It's about different, different views about what development could be and that we don't necessarily need to be focusing on these more neoliberal forms of development. We need to think, think differently. And I think that is really an essential part of what they, they bring to the table. Um, and I'll just leave it at that because I feel like everybody else has said so much that's so powerful, but that, yeah, it's really important bringing these, the more positive sides that, that for everybody who's attacked, we have stories of resistance of these, you know, beautiful communities coming together. You know, it is about hope as well, that they, they are bringing hope to the table, hope for something different. Um, I'll stop. <laughs> now that's such an important message. It is equally about hope um, and we definitely have to focus on um, the positives here. Um, and so finally, Georgie, um, and you have such a crisp way of, of defining things, but also capturing kind of like the big picture of it all. Um, would you be able to, to tell us what your views are um, when it comes to the kind of the pivotal role that environmental human rights defenders play um, in contributing to sustainable development, perhaps as, as a goal at that more global level? I just want to check if my audio better than it was before. Yes, I think still it's still a little bit soft, but okay. um, much clearer. All right, okay, I'll try and speak uh, loud, louder. Um, so I think uh, the others have really eloquently talked about the role of environmental human rights defenders and, and those who play a role in advocating for the environment and all of the interlinked aspects of the environment. And for the UN, I think the UN plays a really important role in upholding this really clear um, frame and, and uh, stance that we have that EHRDs play an important and a legitimate role uh, in upholding and implementing and advancing environmental rule of law, but also our relationship with the natural world. And I, that to me is is something that I think is so important that um, the the UN and, and UN colleagues can continue to uh, advocate for and, and clearly delineate that this legitimacy in in the role of EHRDs. 
And, and when we speak to environmental rule of law, I think some of the things really resonated that, uh, that Dylan was saying and that Elisa was saying and Fran and, and everyone really, Mary as well, that it's, it's not perhaps rule of law as it's been defined only in some contexts. We are also talking about customary law. And, and legal plurality is so important with regard to the consideration of environmental law. Um, that we need to think about how those relationships are structured and defined in different cultural contexts. And, and we know that community organizations, individuals, civil society in general, are key partners in addressing these disproportionate impacts of environmental harm that I, that I talked about earlier, and, and that they're key partners in addressing um, environmental damage and protecting the environment. Uh, basically, it's through their work that we learn about the scope of violations of environmental rights that we are able to support uh, victims of human rights violations, that we can support good governance uh, and, and creating awareness of the interlinkages between human and environment. Um, and so, uh, you know, as, as we in a supporting role, continue our work, it's it's really critical that we do have that dialogue. And, you know, we talked, uh, someone else talked about the importance of having dialogue and scaling up these local initiatives. And we need to bring that dialogue at different scales. We need to have that same level of really rich dialogue at the international level, as well as at the regional level and at the national level. Um, and I also just wanted to add, you know, that there have been strong resolutions on the contributions of EHRDs, that in 2019, the UN Human Rights Council unanimously adopted the resolution 40-11, which recognized the contribution of EHRDs to the enjoyment of human rights, um, environmental protection, and sustainable development. Uh, and, and just having this resolution is quite critical as it provides further um, uh, impetus for us to, to advance our mandate uh, which is critical, you know, the, the mandate is central for the UN to uphold human rights, uh, you know, it's, it's part of the, the charter. Uh, and so it's, it's uh, really important that we remind ourselves that we all have a key role to play in ensuring that EHRDs are seen as these legitimate actors, these really important actors on the international um, basis of, of dialogue in environmental governance as well as all of the levels that have been. Um, just one last thing to add, um, Fran spoke about the threats that are facing defenders and these are continuing to be exacerbated and we have seen during COVID pandemic that these threats have not abated, that in some cases that they have intensified. Um, there's also been an increasing trend towards um, defenders, environmental human rights defenders being lab labeled as uh, terrorists, or in some contexts they call it red tagging. Uh, and, and this is leading to a greater sense of impunity in some contexts. And so you're seeing greater criminalization as well as intimidations and attacks against defenders. And again, because of this trend, I think it's also critical that we do have um, those that are have strong voices at these different international forums as well as at, at regional forums um, that can create space, protect the space of, of civil society. I'll leave it there, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Georgie. And that important point about space, about dialogue, um, brings me to the conclusion of this uh, panel thus far. Um, and I have to also acknowledge the fact that there is there is a very good question that has been put through the chat box. Um, so we will be addressing those questions after a five minute break, which we will now take. Um, and I have to say we're right on time. So everyone, if you could please make sure that you take no more than five minutes to stretch your legs, grab a cup of coffee, check your internet connection. That would be fantastic. And then once you come back, um, Georgie will take over and she will 
um, look at Jamboard, but also um, look through the questions in the chat box. So if you have any further questions in the meantime, feel free to populate them or put them through the chat box. And if you have any further notes for Jamboard, please feel free to, to add more post-its or sticky notes as well. On that note, let's take a break, everyone. Just to say that we'll recommence in about one minute. Um, so please start making your way back with your coffee, your stretch legs, your ideas. <laughs> 
thank you, everyone. I think we will recommence. Uh, we've got some fantastic uh, further discussions to have. Um, but first, before I get into some of the questions that we had organized, I want to take a couple of questions that have been posted in the chat. Um, and we've had an excellent question that makes linkages to the UN uh, decade on ecosystem restoration. Um, particularly a question, and I and I might uh, send this one. Pichimon, you haven't responded to anything yet, so I'll I'll send this to you and then pass it on to others that would like to respond. Uh, given the recent UN General Assembly's resolution that adopted the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, what role do you think environmental defenders can play in enhancing ecological restoration? Um, so, Pichimon, I'll start with you and then anyone else. Sure, thank you very much, Georgie. Um, and again, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, and it really is about the positives um, as opposed to dwelling only on the negatives. And I think in my own experiences and in the work that I've seen, my colleagues who are environmental human rights defenders have done in China and Southeast Asia um, and elsewhere in the world. The kind of the amazing thing that they do is it's not just about opposing the state or opposing a development project. It's also about transforming how people within their communities think about their relationships with the environment. Um, and certainly what I've seen um, in one case in India, for instance, uh, was a group of environmental human rights defenders um, basically trying to, to kind of shift their community back into thinking about the environment, not as a resource, but as a living thing. Um, and I noticed as well on the Jamboard, someone mentioned the whole issue around the personhood of, of the environment, of rivers and so forth. And I think that's where the ecosystem restoration comes in. Only until we kind of fully appreciate that we are dealing here with complex ecosystems that are all interrelated, um, can we actually then try to really protect the environment, but also not just prevent a harmful development projects, but also ensure that um, the way in which we interact with the environment is truly sustainable as well. So I've seen those types of examples where it's about um, reconditioning almost um, one's perspective of the of nature, but I've also seen cases where as a result of kind of long term engagement and dialogue with um, international bodies like the IUCN um, environmental human rights defenders have been able to prompt uh, a, a attitudinal shift as well within these organizations to think of conservation, not just about conservation for the sake of conservation, but to think more in terms of nature based solutions of harmonizing again human human environment relationships. And I think in the long term, that has a very real and important implication for ecosystem restoration, um, given that these organizations, of course, are responsible for helping governments to look after protected areas, natural reserves, forest parks, and so, so forth. Um, so I think it's, I'll, I'll stop there, but I think the special role that environmental defenders play is they're already doing it in one sense, but at the same time, it's really about um, promoting that shift in attitudes towards the environment, not as a thing or a resource, but as an, a living organism. And to also consider how we are just part of a much larger ecosystem um, is also equally important to generating uh, those shifts and creating restoration. I'll stop there. Thank you, Pichaman. And I think it's really interesting how the the hashtag for the decade is uh, generation restoration. And it's really seemed to be sort of like this collective uh, approach to to working towards ecosystem generate uh, ecosystem restoration that really is in, in, entirely aligned with the role of environmental human defenders. Uh, so I want to also bring in Elisa to give her perspectives on, on this question. Thank you. And it's very much aligned with what uh, Pichamon just said, but perhaps placing it in the context of an uh, earlier conversation on, on the need for ecosystem restoration uh, in the context of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And within the context, also the appreciation of the risks that may come from more efforts and investment in ecosystem restoration, if that leads to what we have seen also in the context of climate uh, 
mitigation and adaptation, which is maybe um, an interest in, you know, quick fix technological approaches or even opportunities for foreign investment or private sector engagement, which may not be aligned to that understanding of nature and our interdependencies with nature and understanding of uh, human rights implications um, that um, Pichamon was just talking about. And so I think eco ecosystem restoration is essential. Uh, and it is so essential also to contribute to climate mitigation and adaptation, but it does present some risk. And the more we raise, you know, the profile of it, the more it may, may attract, like blue economy has attracted, unfortunately, interest that may be uh, going against environmental objectives and human rights objectives. So there's certainly a role there for defenders to, to make sure that it doesn't take that route. Uh, but also, more importantly, a role for, for all of us and for all the decision makers and scientists involved in this to really engage with that um, uh, dialogue across worldviews of nature and really look at what is already happening, maybe in, in too few and smaller parts of the world that's already contributing to ecosystem restoration. And so the customary sustainable practices um, of indigenous peoples and other uh, small scale users and how ecosystem restoration is a way to recognize their contribution to protect those areas and in fact expand and, and give further opportunities for those approaches to um, to benefit us all um, and recognize their contribution. So, so I think there's huge opportunity, but th there are risks and, and as de defenders and those working with defenders, unfortunately need to be looking both ways and contribute both ways. Uh, because unfortunately, if some of the risk materialize, they can very well undermine existing and further opportunities for that um, customary sustainable use and traditional knowledge based ecosystem restoration um, that we need. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I, I want to now turn to uh, Dylan and Taryn um, and build on this with another question that we've received through the chat, which is given how difficult, draining and dangerous the work of environmental human rights defenders is, what strategies are there to build resilience? of activism and of individual activists are working. So what strategies have you employed with the communities that you work with on oceans, uh, governance and, and justice? What strategies for resilience are working? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. I mean, the one thing, the one strategy we're working with a lot, and it was mentioned earlier, I think by Fran, I can't remember who mentioned it, but around the importance of um, and this is kind of a more recent response, but we realized one of the strategies is kind of citizen uh, journalism and the ways in which we can um, kind of protect people's identities when needed, but the ways in which um, powerful public storytelling is needed. Um, and so, and really mobilizing the cap capacities that already exist of um, coastal ocean defenders in the work that we do, of young people who already live in those communities who have, you know, we just finished a workshop two weeks, uh, a week ago with uh, 13 young activists who are the most incredible, like intuitive sociologists who have a really refined and powerful perspective, a uh, complex perspective of the entangled realities, both from cultural historical practices that have led to the situations that are happening now, but also what's happening for example, with the current blue economy system and how it's um, impacting on their livelihoods and practices that, you know, I think one of the most important strategies is supporting those storytellers and those places to tell their own stories in national, international policy place forums, but also in, in the public and popular media. So we found ourselves very much trying to support and mobilize that capacity. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. I mean, I think that um, what we are really trying to do is to create uh, very resilient networks made up of people and organizations in different uh, positions within our society um, uh, in order to both um, like amplify the voices of environmental human rights defenders based in communities and based at the front lines of these injustices. Um, in order to ensure that um, those activists, as well as those who would either silence them or do them harm, 
that, that it's very clear that there are people watching and aware and um yeah who are who are able to mobilize the media or to mobilize legal support um so so yeah a, a strong network has um activists at the heart but consists of um lawyers artists uh journalists researchers um who are um who are in service of an agenda that is set by the activists, but able to mobilize other resources and access um, to to kick in. I mean, on a very practical level, uh, we run a sort of virtual WhatsApp group um, in which people can quickly um, either ask for advice or ask, for example, for us to help with writing and sending a press release or help with submitting comments on a new uh, policy or plan that will impact them. So, yeah, uh, uh, those kinds of structures and, and practically and, and sort of financial support for something as simple as a WhatsApp group has gone a very long way um, over the last year, particularly under COVID, where people couldn't meet in person. Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic suggestions. And I'm going to turn now to, to Fran and Mary, um, but I'm going to add to this an, another element that was added in the chat, which is uh, how can environmental defenders be effectively empowered to protect the environment when civic space in their country has been shrinking and the government may use COVID-19 restrictions uh, to ban gatherings and other forms of expression. And I know this is something that you have uh, seen and identified as a trend in Southeast Asia. Um, so can I turn first to Fran? Hi, yes. Um, and I just wanna start by saying I completely second everything and agree with everything that Taryn was saying. Um, about networks and the importance of networks and the importance of those networks being led by defenders. Um, that's something that we've seen as well um, in the work that we've been doing. And I want to mention the Asia Pacific Network for Environmental Defenders uh, that we've been working with, um, which is active across Southeast Asia. Um, and and look, recently some youth environmental defenders in Cambodia whom we work with have, um, have connected with APNED this network and it's been a really wonderful mobilizing um, tool or a tool for outreach for getting their message out to um, a network across Southeast Asia for getting con connections with the media and for greater recognition. And so actually that kind of network and digital organizing connecting with others um, who have the same objectives or, or who are working parallel in other countries, uh, we've seen that that is a really powerful way to raise voices to a regional level or to an international level. Um, and yes, recently in Cambodia, well, throughout 2020, there has been a real increase in um, the restriction of civic space. And that has also been particularly um, severe against environmental human rights defenders. Uh, in particularly, for example, people who community members and forest activists who are trying to engage in the protection of prey long forest and of prey prey raka forest have been banned from entering the forest. They've been banned from conducting forest patrols. Um, so their ability to participate has been really restricted. Um, and in addition, the emergency laws of uh, 2020 not only in Cambodia, but in many countries in Southeast Asia are very restrictive in terms of um, how they, you know, gatherings have been banned, but this is also uh, potentially going beyond um, the need for social distancing and the need for um, reduced contact between people um, to limit the spread of the virus. So, so yeah, how can people organize under these constrained situations and constrained conditions? Um, one answer is online, um, and another answer is sort of deepening sort of within communities and even within individuals themselves. Um, people are 
often turning inwards and expressing their stories or their visions, um, you know, through art or through through writing. Um, and that is also an extremely powerful way that people have responded to um, to the constrict constrictions of the pandemic. Thank you so much, uh, Fran. Mary, can I ask you to add from your um, your experiences also in in South America? Uh, yeah, so sure. So I mean, I think the situation for South America might be slightly different in that the um, well, many of the governments are not responding to to COVID in such a strict way and actually um COVID is being used as an excuse uh to as in brazil the environmental minister said let the cattle run because you know the everybody's distracted by the COVID. let's let's let let uh development and the cattle run through the amazon at a free because because you know, no one's paying attention um and so i think in the case of of, of latin america it is much more around standing up against that um but but that people again have been using a lot of online um organizing methods because you can't it's not safe to to have as many protests although that's changing now and people are more out on the streets as you will have probably seen the last week uh indigenous peoples were in brasilia um fighting for their, their land rights. There was a massive protest against Bolsonaro government just uh, on Saturday. So there is um, a shift, but, but I think it's important to think about the potential that these online spaces have for both giving access to spaces that were previously closed off to, to people to participate, that there's more opportunities now for uh, environmental defenders from anywhere to be involved in an online webinar because webinars are more of a thing. You know, they they were a thing before, but they're very much more present. And conferences are now online. And although internet connections may be weak, they're still able in 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 many ways to participate in spaces that were previously closed to them. Um, and I and I think there's more and more platforms and spaces for uh, indigenous peoples and environmental defenders to tell their stories. And I think that links back to, to what Taryn and, and Dylan were saying, you know, that we need to create, create ways uh, for, for people to tell their stories and to, to create spaces to amplify their voices. And, and I think that's one of the things that, that we have been trying to do and I put a link in the Jamboard, but I'll put a link here as well, that we've created a space in Brazil, particularly for artists and indigenous students to tell their stories, but that we were as a, as a broader network and as a broader project, we'll be amplifying to include other countries. And I think it's a space that, you know, it could very easily include any, any of the, you know, anyone who's here who would like to share their stories. I think we're trying to create that kind of a space. Um, to amplify the stories of of the communities and the defenders themselves so that it's not just depending on the media to tell these stories because it's often hard you know we we send press releases we tell people oh so you know somebody's been threatened there's been an attack and 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 journalists often don't pick it up because for whatever reasons it's not hot enough um but the, these stories really do need to be told and so we can find other ways to to spread them and I think if that's potential, the potential there uh, in creating ways to get stories out that don't depend on the big, the big media outlets um, is really important, particularly during the pandemic. I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. And I, and I want to talk some more about the, the challenges that communities have faced as a result of the pandemic and particularly the challenges for defenders of undertaking the work to protect vulnerable environments and, and communities. And I just want to reference uh, quickly to the, the Jamboard because we asked this question in the Jamboard um, of what ha has been observed in different countries for environmental defenders. And it's interesting, um, some of the responses is that there's been increasing harassment, intimidation and persecution. 
that defenders are being ignored and overlooked, that there is fast increase of mining investment and agri-industrial projects, that there are increasing victims of slaps and smear campaigns, and that the work of defenders is increasingly dangerous. Uh, attempts to delegitimize EHRDs by la labeling them anti-development and the increased use of slap suits or strategic lawsuits against public participation to silence uh, activists. And indeed what Fran was saying, you know, governments using COVID-19 restrictions to pressure rights to protection and gathering, freedom of association, freedom of assembly uh, is, is under threat. Um, and I, I also want to, so I want to open this up to all of our uh, amazing speakers of what challenges they have observed that the COVID-19 pandemic has posed for environmental human rights defenders uh, and how defenders have also exhibited resilience and found opportunities during the pandemic. But before I open it up, I just want to also share one personal anecdote um, that we work in Thailand quite closely with an indigenous community up north. Uh, and we were inviting a representative, a youth representative of this community to join an environmental defender forum that we were having an online forum. Uh, but where she lived, there was very little access to technology. So, you know, an impact of, of the digital divide and uh, in accordance with her community's traditions, when there is a disease, their community goes into a cultural isolation. And so it was actually also counter to her traditional, uh, uh, the traditional beliefs of her community for her to actually access technology to join this forum that would have connected her with other defenders uh, as a result of, of the pandemic. So I, I you know, I, I think there are lots of layers of challenges uh, to participation and, and while uh, moving to online has actually provided some opportunities for connecting, it is also con continuing to have some barriers uh, for some communities. So maybe if I can first turn to Elisa uh, to respond to this question and then I will turn to Pichiman. Yeah, so I, I probably can contribute very little. I think Dylan and Taryn will have a lot to say uh, on this, but I guess on, on my end, the kind of more remote and it's been interesting to see how the UN has mobilized quite quickly around the understanding of the impacts of COVID and COVID responses to the shrinking civic space. I know that the UN Food and Agriculture Organization quickly created uh, online spaces both to monitor um, the rules that were developed and uh, and try and understand how they were impacting small scale fishers, for instance, uh, with the UN division on the law of the sea, we were running online capacity building programs for ocean lawyers and policymakers. And we were able very quickly, like early on in during the first term, I guess, uh, European lockdown and maybe lockdowns in other regions to share some of the early research findings from our colleagues in, in South Africa and in Ghana about the impacts of um, COVID responses on small scale fishers. So I thought those are in a way some uh, slightly remote uh, quick responses, but they may be really important to understand whether internationally there is support available, opportunities for different communities to network and learn about you know, one another's um, approaches. Um, and so that was really inspiring. I think something that we need to think more systematically about how uh, different bodies of the UN together can, with, within their respective mandates, really create a very, um, you know, tightly knit and very accessible uh, set of um, resources and support for, for defenders on the ground. But in terms of more concrete support that maybe academics and, and civil society can provide on the ground, I think Dylan and Tarin have a lot to say and have, uh, it's been fascinating for me to see what they came up with in terms of uh, ensuring direct access to uh, decision making during the times of, of lockdown. Thank you, Lisa. I'll turn to Pichamon and then I'll come back to, to Dylan and, and Taryn on this point. 
I think there are two levels when we talk about the challenges that environmental human rights defenders face during the time of COVID. I think at the practical level, obviously, um, if and I've been communicating with again my colleagues who are defenders in Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, China, and so forth. Um, if you look at Myanmar with the with the coup of, and the travel restrictions imposed by COVID, those are very real barriers, of course, to um, tracking and keeping an eye on uh, harmful development projects. Um, the other challenge for them as well is about the need to lay low. And with a lot of environmental defenders, their first instinct is not to lay low, right? But to actually go out and, and fight whatever injustice they see in front of them. So there's that tension at that personal level as well that we're seeing. Um, at the same time, if you look at Laos or Cambodia, we've heard of instances where harmful or deleterious um, development projects have gone ahead um, without the knowledge of communities impacted um, under the cover of COVID-19 and the restrictions that that imposes on these communities. Um, and certainly, you know, this is something that I think we're seeing in other contexts in other parts of the world as well. So, yes, again, another practical um, challenge there, um, not to even mention funding issues, which is a question that has been asked multiple times in the chat box already. Um, but to talk a little bit more about the normative challenge, I think, and this is one example that I also see from the Thai case, but also from the Chinese case, um, there is a growing challenge on the part of environmental defenders in these countries to actually ensure that public attention and not just policy attention is directed to their plight and to their causes. Um, and this is in large part because COVID-19 has taken so much of the public um, attention for understandable reasons, but it also means that as a result, um, less attention, less resources, less support has been uh, directed to environmental human rights defenders and their campaigns. Similarly for Thailand, I think there's been this growing concern amongst longstanding civil society activists that there is increasing polarization, especially of a political kind um, within the country, which sees um, even fraction, fractures, fissures emerge within the civil society community themselves. Um, and so this ability to actually remain resilient in the face of not just the pandemic, but also political pressures um, to not side politically, but to still fight for the environment and fight for social justice and human rights um, is something that I've been seeing that a lot of my colleagues on the ground have been struggling with, not because they don't have the clarity of purpose, but because the social and political and economic constraints they face now, especially under COVID conditions, is so great that they have to kind of um, be even more cautious in how they proceed. Thank you, Pitchman. Those are some really important points and uh, the financial pressures that a lot of communities have faced, the additional layers of financial pressures under COVID, as well as all of the other uh, really important um, also social pressures that a lot of communities have faced under COVID uh, are really important to them. So I want to now turn to uh, Taryn and, and Dylan. Uh, to add on experience. Yes, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I echo and relate to a lot of what um, Pichamon has just shared. So we saw, uh, you know, a huge um, shrinking of the available spaces for participation or um, gathering to respond to injustices that were occurring um, things that were occurring in coastal contexts prior to the pandemic, um, but were exacerbated when people went into hard lockdown. So there were instances where a group of community activists, 10 leaders were arrested for having a meeting during our hard lockdown time. And the meeting was to talk about urgent responses to the fact that there was no water in their village and everyone was forced to be in lockdown and couldn't even do the ordinary activity of when there's a water cut off to walk to the river to collect water. So there was a meeting around how to pool money to get a water tank brought into the community and those community leaders were arrested for gathering. Um, uh, a, a sort of a real lag in communication. So early on in our COVID lockdown, there were, um, you know, 
every, everyone was unsure of what the regulations were around what constituted an essential service um, and therefore who was allowed to leave their home to engage in essential service activities and for example fishing was deemed to be a, a recreational or a non-essential service and then there was uh, you know, a hurried effort by civil society to make the case for subsistence fishers who rely on fishing for literally for being able to eat and put food on the table for their families, for that to be um, considered an essential service. But that message took a long time to get to law enforcement, to police, to uh, conservation officials. So there were many, many subsistence fisher folk arrested for leaving their homes to go fishing fishing, even though actually at a, at a high level that had been deemed to be legal um, under hard lockdown. Um, then, of course, we saw just everything moving online with absolutely no effort to um, make that in some way accessible for community based organizations and community representatives. We also saw that when um, due to the pandemic, uh, there was a national state of disaster declared and under the national state of disaster, there are certain um, things that are usually legal requirements for developments to take place that uh, were put to one side. So while, you know, certain uh, development projects were put on pause until after the lockdown, um, many of them were actually given the green light to go ahead as soon as lockdown regulations were eased, but their requirements for consultation had actually been um, due to the national state of disaster, they had managed to bypass many steps in the usual uh, consultation, legal consultation process. So we just saw really a, a, a massive increase in applications for oil and gas uh, exploration in the coast and in the seabed, coastal sand um, mining, coastal sand mining uh, many, many um, extractive um, projects on our coast that are that are very much being um, justified as part of the economic recovery from the pandemic. Um, and the and these are going ahead with very, very little consultation or, or participation. Um, so, yeah, but what what we what I wanted to say as a sort of a, um, positive. a, a positive. So, so some, of, you know, a lot of what we have focused on is both really arguing for consultation processes to either for everything to wait until such a time as people can meaningfully participate. And if not to really try to support people to join those meetings by providing data bundles, by traveling to people and sitting with, um, you know, our own uh, devices to access the Internet so that people can join. Um, we've phoned people and had them on speakerphone while we connect via Zoom. Many different things for different meetings to try to get people's voices into those meetings. And what it has meant is that um, as 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 non ideal as the online meeting space is for many community groups, when we have managed as a network to meet online, there are um, organizations from different regions of our country who otherwise would not meet and who are very focused on, you know, very, very focused, um, understandably, on local issues and local injustices and responding very much to the day to day impacts that are affecting their own communities and regions. But what has been happening is that groups are now meeting and building a greater solidarity and a greater understanding of one another's politics and a greater understanding of one another's struggles and strategies through being able to meet uh, online um, and, and now a real, real wish that when uh, COVID allows for these groups who were not really aware of each other before to, to meet in person and to build a stronger alliance um that um yeah that is able to more strategically as a more kind of united grouping rather than many individual separate groups respond to some of the um some of the issues um and then you know what we saw really was that um when when hard lockdown occurred and people in communities were were hungry and really struggling it was often 
um, the people we're now calling environmental human rights defenders are, are community defenders and activists in every context. So it was these people who were organizing community kitchens and making sure that food was being shared and children were being looked after and really setting up local local response activities to support people through the the social impacts of lockdown. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and one, some of the things that you were saying, particularly around the increase in, in applications for extractive activities, extractives, uh, we have seen in other parts of the world also uh, rollbacks in environmental safeguards around EIA processes and around other elements that are being put in place by governments in order to support a rapid economic recovery from the pandemic, but at the cost of the environment uh, and to enable investment in, in these environmentally destructive uh, sectors. Um, and so I want to turn now also to, to Fran because um, Fran has has done some research also on this uh, the the trends around environmental laws and and changes as a result of the pandemic. Um, so Fran, if you want to speak to that and also potentially also speaking to other ways that communities have been resilient during the pandemic. Thank you, Georgie. Um, yes, so. Um, so speaking to this, and, and I'll bring in a question that was raised in the chat. So um, are defenders funding themselves to do their job? And this relates also to the COVID pandemic because a lot of defenders, as has been mentioned, are community members, fisher folk, farmers, people who are um, making their livelihoods from forest resources, for example. And due to the restrictions of the pandemic, many people weren't able to support themselves um, through selling products at market, for example, because of travel restrictions. And this has been impacting people's livelihoods and, and yeah, their, their funding essentially for their important work. Um, and uh, yeah, so I would say the majority of defenders are people who are self-supported, who, who fund themselves. Um, and and also often you know support their community. They're members of a of a community that is resisting. So uh, so COVID and the impact the travel restrictions has has also impacted people's livelihoods and their ability to to resist in that sense. Um, and speaking to um, the point about environmental impact assessments. Um, I'll give one example, which is that in Indonesia, the uh, omnibus law brought in changes to the environmental impact assessment process, um, which is called AMDAL. Uh, and this means that there is the general public are not able to participate in the way in which they previously were. So the only people who are consulted or you know, legally required to be consulted um, are directly impacted community members. And this means, of course, there is much less scrutiny possible um, over incoming development projects. Um, and the omnibus law as a whole has brought in, you know, a great swathe of changes um, sort of across the board, not only in environmental regulations, but also to labor rights. Um, and, and this means that the, the impact is, is really, really far reaching. And, Added to that, often environmental impact assessments, um, because of the COVID restrictions on travel, are no longer need to be in-person um, consultations. And this means that sometimes people are not able to have pre-prior and informed consent uh, to development projects that are coming in because they haven't been consulted in person. There might have been an online consultation, but in some cases, that's not possible to attend or to join if there's limited connectivity, for example, in a community, or if there hasn't been enough outreach or um, enough work done to make that accessible. Uh, so I'll I'll leave it there for example. Thank you, Fran. And I want to turn to Mary now. Uh, Mary, we've had a further question about in what ways cooperation with local communities and other civil society organizations by environmental defenders help in enhancing the work of defenders and offering them better protection. And I thought, could you speak to 
the situation in, in South America and how uh, these solidarity networks and, and um, support from multiple organizations, whether they be community-based organizations or other civil society organizations, can provide uh, defenders with um, protection. Sure. Um, thanks. Thanks, Treji. I think um, one of the things that we see happening quite a lot, and 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 I think this is during the pandemic and and before, um, is that these networks are able to identify individuals or groups that really need support, um, and and work with them to figure out what support they really need. Um, and, and I think, and some of that is, is removing themselves from very severe cases of, of tense situations where they're being, you know, we have an example right now in a Munduruku village in, in Brazil was attacked by gold miners um, a few weeks ago and their house, some of the houses were burnt down and people were shot at. So, so there has been a very, very strong movement to to support them and that has involved both local local groups um but it's also international ngos and we are we as not one more are trying to raise some money for them as well you know it's about tapping into uh such a kind of wide networks uh, of support and that some of that is about removing people from situations of extreme tension so that they don't get killed some of it is about building resilience later and identifying what kinds of levels or layers of security can be put in place. Um, some of it is about making noise. So again, with this particular case of the Munduruku, some of the organizations stepped in to support them to be able to go to the protests in Brasilia to make noise there, to, to have the space to speak to um, the federal indigenous agency and, 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 and make their complaints there. Um, some of the organizations are gathering support to rebuild the community. You know, so it really is about this, this sense that different actors within the networks can step in and provide support, different layers of support, you know, that we really need to be thinking about who, who can help them with what, um, but also I think this is something that we with that one more really come back to is also we need to think about the longer term support and, and how to deal with the trauma that a lot of communities have experienced. Um, both as individuals and, and as and collectively that they have understandably gone through, you know, are experiencing trauma and, and, and how do you, how do you recover from that level of, of trauma? So I think it's not just about, um, physical security, digital security, it's also about mental health and, and well-being and thinking about supporting people. And I think the visibility um, and going back to some of the things that I think that Fran said and some others have said, it's also about this sense of solidarity and knowing that you're not alone. And I think that we, um, you know, throughout the pandemic, but throughout, in general, I think that there's this sense that we really need to make sure that people know that other people support them and that they actually care. And, and sometimes we forget just how isolated people can feel and, and that when they're constantly facing attacks and threats and people calling them horrible names and smearing their reputations, they can feel very alone and they don't know that actually, you know, people like us are sitting around having this conversation and there's so many other people out there that, there that really do support them. And I think that that visibility and that building of these networks of solidarity and support um, is really is really important in giving them in 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 a sense their mental health and their well being, knowing that they're part of something bigger and that there are people that they're not just the targets of attacks. That actually, there's a lot of people out there, more people out there that support them than not. Um, I'm not sure if I fully answered your question, yeah. but I, no, no, I think, you know, think these networks have. are really essential and, and that they give people the financial support, the digital security training, the, the physical support. You know, there's so many ways in which different individuals can step up and, and help. 
Um, and I think that's part of it is identifying who can do what um, to support the very many sort of intersectional aspects of, of the kinds of thing attacks that they're experiencing. I'll stop there. Thank you, Mary. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, so we are out of time and I've had so much uh, fun on this panel listening to all of the insights that I have gone a bit over time uh, with the moderation. But in, in finishing, I want to turn to each speaker to give a last comment, one minute uh, comment or reflection to finish the panel. So I'm going to turn first to Elisa and then Dylan and Taryn, and then Fran uh, and Pichimon for a last comment uh, as we round up the panel. So first, over to you, Elisa. Thank you. And I would really like to build on what Mary just said. Uh, I've, I've been engaged with the, the EU, the European Parliament and European External Action Service, who are actually increasing their support for environmental human rights defenders. Recently, UNEP and others organized a UN global consultation and what, what struck me is that there is a lot of um, support available internationally, uh, including significant financial, logistical, legal training support, as well as like possibilities to put pressures on governments. Um, but I think there is work that we need to do all together in terms of really creating connections across scales uh, so that on the one hand, we really match needs and opportunities, I think for the UN and you know maybe also through the UN, all the donors who are active in this area to really coordinate and, and map out what the, um, what the support is and making it accessible to the local level. Uh, and finally, creating channels when there can be an evolving understanding of the needs of defenders. So realizing, for instance, that we need to look at the specificities of ocean defenders, how further needs, like what Mary said around, you know, supporting mental health, all of that, there needs to be um, an open channel. So I think that there's work that we can do, um, academia and the UN system and others, to really make all that support um, available, accessible and responsive, because there, there is a lot out there, but somehow uh, it's hard to navigate at the moment. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, over to Dylan and Taryn. Thanks so much. Um, I think my final point would really be the importance of supporting champions in each community, particularly young people, uh, or not necessarily only young people. I don't want to ghettoize just young people, but um, the importance of um, powerful storytellers, um, artists that are sitting in, in 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 these places who are often not getting an opportunity to practice their art, um, and and are really um, politically aware and politically rigorous in in how they are telling the stories of their place and the ways in which they rights um, are being violated, both their human rights, the ocean's rights, and their ancestors' rights. Um, so I think really it's so important and we need to really think about how can we mobilize the existing capacity. This isn't about capacity building, it's about really affirming and supporting existing capa capacities and knowledges that often are not seen as very important to these kinds of movements and how can we support those? And I think that's critical work. Thanks, Dylan. Um, I'm reflecting on, on how many of us spoke about how um, um, people may not define themselves as environmental human rights defenders or as ocean defenders, but there's something really uh, powerful and important and a role that people like us as allies to um, environmental human rights defenders can play in celebrating and um, really shining a light on this role that we see through our framings and uh, discourse, the role that we see um, that is being played by people um, and yeah, under so much threat and under so much um, constraint, but to really be lifting those stories up and, and celebrating them for the, the, the role of, of leadership and um, uh, taking on of risk on behalf of all of us because they are protecting environments and cultures that all of us uh, that, you know, that add to um, a healthy planet for all of us. Um, so really, yeah, it, for us to be celebrating and um, lifting those stories up and also 
um, that there's a lot of invisible work that happens in um, relationship building and nurturing this, this invisible work we're talking about it as network the work of network that is quite hard to name and hard to see but um actually is very very um essential um for these resilience networks that we've been speaking about to exist and that um the sort of output or impact of that might not be be immediately easy to see, but that in the in the nature and the depth of relationships that are formed um, is something completely irreplaceable. And so um, we who sit in our different institutions have a role to play in making that invisible work of activism and relationship and network building um, more visible and more valued. Um, thank you. Thank you. Fran, your last thoughts. Sorry, it took me a second to unmute. Um, yes, following on from what everyone said so far, I would just again highlight the importance of being led by defenders in everything that we do in um, creating access and creating room for participation for those who are frontline who and whatever obstacles that means overcoming in terms of language, in terms of the digital divide. Um, and, and also creating other forms or other avenues for expression, in visual expression, spiritual expression. Um, and yeah, celebrating, as Sharon was saying, celebrating the work of environmental defenders and um, making this as inclusive and as broad and as big a definition as it as it needs to be to recognize and to highlight the work of all those who are acting in so many different ways to protect the environment. Thank you, friend. Mary, some final thoughts. I feel like I've spoken too much. I, I, I just, again, I think that there's so many wonderful things going on and it's just about, about working together and, and sharing the stories of hope. And I think it's through these hopeful expressions that we can really get more people, um, more people involved. That's all. Thank you. And Pichuman, over to you. Thank you. I'm going to focus just my final remarks on the Jamboard and what I learned from the Jamboard. Thank you to everyone who has contributed to that. It's, it was really wonderful seeing all of the post-its come to life. Um, and I'm just going to reflect on three key on the on three key questions, given that it's abundantly clear that environmental human rights defenders are currently facing a slate of challenges, um, not least due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But firstly, with regard to the question of what is the relation, what is what is people, what are people's relationships with the environment? Um, it's clear that in addition to the kind of the legal or social understanding of a responsibility to the environment and to human rights protection, um, there's also a very profound personal and spiritual connection that comes through um, the the board as well. And I think it's summarized in this uh, this one particular post that says, "I live within within it and change it." but I'm also affected by it. Um, I think following from that, it's really clear that in defining the role of environmental human rights defenders, um, that there are multiple roles that they can uh, shoulder um, or, or take up. Um, but I wanted to focus on three that really came through the board. The first being knowledge bearer, the second being the guardian, and the third being strategic thinkers. Um, and I think what that kind of that spectrum of roles really highlights is um, the answer to the third question, right? Who at the end of the day are environmental human rights defenders? And I think the answer there that came through the Jamboard, but certainly through the panel uh, discussions and the speakers as well, is that environmental defenders are united um, by their principled ideas. Um, and this care, this genuine care for the environment, for for human rights, um, and for wanting to do good uh, for their community, for their society. And if we think about it from those broad terms, I suppose 
like it's not to dilute the concept or the the meaning of an environmental human rights defender, but it is clear that as a result, um, human rights defenders, environmental human rights defenders, sorry, can come in all shapes and forms, um, and that they can and do um, come from all walks of life as well. Um, and so, for that reason, I think it's safe to say that the people attending this session either are or have the potential to become environmental human rights defenders. Um, and just as there can be oceans defenders and land based defenders, um, so there can be also defenders on the front line, but also those that work behind the scenes to support the very important work that those on the front lines do. And I'll stop there. Thank you again to everyone. Thank you very much, Pijaman. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who has spoken today to our amazing panelists. Um, and thank you uh, to the school for allowing us to join this first session of the inaugural year of the summer winter school. Um, so with those thanks, I'll turn it back to Dina if you have some final things to say. Thank you, Georgina. Um, just to echo Georgina, thank you to our incredible panelists. Thank you um, to Georgina for moderating it and to Pitchman for the questions and to each of your kind of really fascinating um, important contributions. I, th I think we couldn't have hoped for a better panel to start our summer winter school. Um, we appreciate it so much. The session has been recorded. We're going to find a way to make that recording accessible because I think it's been an incredibly rich conversation and, and, and I, I'm sure many of us want to revisit it. Um, and I'm just going to stop there, except to say that our next session is starting in about an hour. It's on environmental crime, waste and human rights. It's going to be taught by Aphrodite Magadi and Amanda LaRue. It's also going to be a fantastic session. So do join us, register if you haven't already. Thank you to all our participants for their fantastic questions. And thanks again to our panelists. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, Dina. Thanks.